We'll begin with approval of the minutes of April 7th, 2021. Can we have I'll a motion? That motion to approve, Madam Chair, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you. And a seconder for the motion, please. I'll second, Tim. Tim Otis, thank you. All in favor of the uh, approving the minutes as circulated from April 7th, 2021, say aye. 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 Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Okay, approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Remembering that if we add anything to the agenda tonight, it requires a unanimous vote from all members, regardless of whether or not they're present. Okay, uh, are there any additions or to the agenda? Uh, Madam Chair, the clerk's office doesn't have any additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Are there any additions requested by the members? Okay, hearing none. We will ask for approval of the order of business as circulated. Mover, please. So moved. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Second, Tim. Okay. All in favor of the uh, order of business uh, as it stands? Aye. 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 Contrary minded? Aye. Okay. It's, it's a little difficult to get everybody's vote in there at once, but I'm assuming I'm not hearing any nays. So motion is carried. Okay. Mm -hmm. Calling for a declaration of conflict of interest. Anyone having any conflict of interest with the uh, cases that we're going to be looking at tonight should let us know now, please. Hearing none, I'll assume there are none. Consideration of deferred business, there is none. Correspondence, petitions and delegations. Is there any correspondence? Uh, Madam Chair, there's been no correspondence received for this meeting. Thank you. Uh, item 6.2 is petitions. I assume we don't have any of those. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, there's no petitions. And 6.3 presentation. Uh, no, Madam Chair, no requests were received. Thank you. We'll move on to reports then. Item number 7.1, which is, which is the staff report 7.1.1, case number 23058. This is an application by KVN Consultants Limited to develop two multi-unit residential buildings containing a combined 100 units at the foot of Millwood Drive on the south side of Sackville Drive, Middle Sackville. This is PID number 40109308, which is the number of the lot. Okay. And we will ask um, our first presenter, which is Dean McDougall. If you're ready, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good evening, everybody. I'll just wait. Uh, having some technical difficulties, so my colleague Stephanie Saloom is going to move through the slides for me. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, <laughs> Zoom doesn't like my computer very much. Uh -huh. All right, well, thank you, Stephanie. Um, okay, so my name is Dean McDougall, and I'm the planner assigned to the case 23058, which is a development agreement application requesting permission to construct two multi-unit dwellings on Sackville Drive. Next slide, please, Stephanie. The applicant, as mentioned, is KVM Consultants uh, Limited, and as I mentioned, uh, the proposal is to construct two four-story apartment buildings with a total of 100 units on a vacant lot on Sackville Drive. Next slide, please, Stephanie. So the subject site is in Middle Sackville on Sackville Drive near the intersection of Millwood Drive, and Marcuson Drive is located northwest of the site, as you can see on this context map on the left and Highway 101 would be to the south. 
Uh, the right-hand image uh, gives a better idea of the size of the site and uh, where it's located uh, in regards to the intersection with Mill Millwood Drive, but also uh, Baker Drive. Um, next slide, please, Stephanie. So the image on the right is an aerial image of the site taken uh, from 2020. And as you can see, it's vacant and it's located in an area of mixed use. So low density residential uses are located at the rear on uh, Baker Drive uh, of the property. And then the commercial uses would be fronting on Sackville Drive, which is the lower part of that aerial image. And uh, the image on the right is a Google Maps image of Sackville Drive. Uh, and so to the right would be the treat area that would be the subject site. And to the left would be the entrance uh, into the Vineyard Family Ministry Center. Next slide, please. This is the site plan uh, submitted uh, for the application. And you can see building A, which would be on the left, and then building B is on the right. And there's two access points uh, proposed uh, to Sackville Drive, uh, leading to the underground parking uh, located in, in each building and also the rear parking lots. And the applicant has stated uh, they will retain as much vegetation, existing vegetation as possible uh, with adding new vegetation to help buffer uh, the development from the residents on Baker Drive. Next slide, please, Stephanie. Here is the site plan um, produced by the applicant. It, it shows uh, the, the site plan transposed over Google Maps imagery. So you get a better idea of how it fits within the context of the, the built area um, in, in the local development. Uh, next slide, please, Stephanie. So the buildings are two mirror images of each other. Um, they are, these are the two elevations of each building. So uh, facing Sackville Drive would be the elevation on the top. And um, the, the elevation on the bottom would be facing the, uh, the rear yard, so the, um, the parking lot, internal parking lot. And as you can see, the building is uh, four stories tall, uh, roughly 38 feet. And it's proposed to be detailed with metal cladding uh, of two colors that have yet to be determined. Next slide, please. This is a graphic uh, provided by the applicant um, and it gives a better feel for the topography of the site and the area and the change in grade from Baker Drive down to Sackville Drive. So as you can see, uh, the approximate street level of Baker Drive at the, at the rear uh, and then it's roughly at the third and, and fourth level of the proposed apartment buildings and then the, the grade of um, Sackville Drive in relation to that. Next slide, please. So the site is designated urban residential and the urban resi de residential designation uh, is designed to recognize the importance of the single unit dwelling environment, but also acknowledging the need for higher density residential in response to diversify the housing needs of the general population. So as such, a policy was created, policy UR8, and it was written to require apartment buildings of six units or more to be considered by development agreement. So a discretionary application that requires public input and a decision by community council. Uh, next slide, please. So to reflect that uh, in the intent of the urban residential designation, the, the base zone R6 was applied. Um, so if someone could go in and, and apply for a single unit dwelling without any special approval required, they could just apply for a permit. Uh, so that's the base zoning R6, rural residential zone. And the existing use is a vacant lot as mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide, please. So policy UR8, list several things council is to consider in any proposal for a multi-unit multi building uh, in this plan area. And they are the compatibility of that uh, proposal with the adjacent land uses, height, massing, and appearance of the, of the, pre, um, the proposal, uh, site design and landscaping, amenity space, is it adequate, traffic impacts of the proposed development, and then the adequacy of the surrounding services, so sewer, water, recreation, transit, things like that. Are they capable of supporting the, the proposed development? Uh, next slide, please. In terms of engagement, uh, the engagement we've completed thus far uh, includes consultation achieved through a mail out notification or website and a virtual meeting, which was held on April 7th. Uh, in terms of the stats on the engagement so far, we sent out 68 notifications 
I've received a phone call from two individuals. We've had 633 unique web page views, so unique IP addresses. That's not necessarily someone hitting um, refresh 633 times on, on the page. And I've received letters or emails from six individuals. And the feedback received uh, generally revolved around three issues. So the first and, and one of the largest was the impact of the development on the abutting residents on Baker Drive. Uh, traffic was another uh, issue raised and the potential impact of the development on the school enrollment in the area, the local schools. Uh, next slide, please. So we ask uh, Northwest PAC to please advise of any recommendation and considerations uh, regarding the proposal with, with specific regard to uh, the compatibility uh, of the proposal with the adjacent land uses, the building design and site layout, including uh, landscaping and screening and traffic impacts. Next slide, please. Uh, I just want to provide a quick update. Um, since the PIM at the beginning of April, the applicant did provide an addendum to the TIS. Uh, they did the traffic, count, traffic counts um, gathered on April 13th, 2021. This information hasn't been uh, reviewed by our municipal engineers yet, but I wanted to share this information uh, with PAC uh, that the addendum was um, submitted recently. And uh, the conclusions of, uh, of that traffic counts um, and of the addendum was that using the traffic counts of today uh, aren't reliable um, as illustrated in this chart here. Uh, and the main reason is because as we all know, we're in a pandemic, so this is affecting traffic patterns. Uh, so the best information we have and, and the information used in the original TIS was the 2017 data collected by, um, by HRM, along with uh, some assumptions uh, about potential increases uh, in traffic since that data collection. So this is just a, an addendum or uh, to your information, for your information too, in your review. Uh, next slide, please. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll now pass it back to you, Madam Chair, for any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we will go to the members for questions and comments, and we'll begin with uh, Vice Chair Nick Horn. Uh, Madam Chair, do you mind if I just interrupt for a moment, please? No, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so everyone, I just want to inform all the members of uh, the committee that um, there's been recent provincial amendments to the HRM charter regarding virtual meetings and our live broadcast of live meetings, um, which require that all members of the committee can be seen by the public, by your fellow committee members during the live broadcast of the meeting. So. I would ask that you turn your cameras on during the discussion section of the meetings, as well as during votes. Um, so if you can uh, do that this evening, that would be much appreciated. And I will turn the floor back over to you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. And there's Nick. And Nick, you are going to be our first Speaking yeah, I, don't have any light. I don't have any lights on in here, but that's fine. You guys are uh, going to have to. We can see over. you. <laughs> uh, um, I really have no questions. I think uh, a development agreement of this sort in this uh, location is respectful, other than um, my recommendation would be to apply conditions of appropriate landscaping and lighting control for the abutting residents. Okay. That's it from you. Okay. I don't think Ryan has arrived or Jordan. Okay. Mm, no, they have not, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Gina Jones Wilson, please. Uh, no, I don't have anything. I just wanted to let you know that my camera is not working at the moment. They do that sometimes. Okay, right? thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, the next uh, one will be uh, Catherine, uh, Jacqueline Lever. Uh, hi. Uh, no, I don't have any. Pardon? I don't have. I don't have any questions. I agree that a development agreement would be a a, a good way to look at this. Okay. 
Thank you. Donelda? No. Stacy Rutterham. I don't have any questions for this application. Thank you. Kathy Diggle Gammon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, from the presentation and from the um, the public meeting, the virtual meeting, I think that was, was there seven in attendance. Something um, like that, yeah. Mr. McDougall, was that? And uh, so my, my question really would be about the buffer um, um, for the families that live on Baker Drive and the kind of landscaping that would provide some privacy for them. Uh, when you looked at the elevation, it looks like the third level would maybe be at the second level of people's homes. And I was just wondering how the developer uh, would you know try to be as respectful as possible with landscaping and um, noise reduction because I think it's hard to see what the landscaping would look like but the maturity of the vegetation and all of that kind of stuff as a noise buffer and privacy buffer I'm curious about uh, supporting the residents on Baker Drive. Okay. Sure yes yeah. so uh, to answer um, Councillor your first question uh, there were seven attendees at the meeting uh, and the landscaping the, the finer details have not been figured out just yet uh, they're just, it's conceptual at this point. Um, we, we'll figure that out during the negotiation process uh, for the development agreement about what uh, what exactly will be provided in the landscape plan. Uh, there will be, it's, um, it, it's going to require a retaining wall in some sections uh, oh. of, the, of the property. So the surface parking lot is going to have to cut into the earth and then the retaining wall is going to have to be built. So that uh, will provide some buffer um, for sound. Um, and then there's also is proposed to be vegetation on top of the hill above the, um, uh, the retaining wall. Uh, okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie, I think if you go to uh, da, 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 the slide 16. There's just sections provided that help provide a visual. Right, that's the one. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So the retaining wall um, would be there, and then there'd be landscaping on top of that, and then and then there would be finally a, uh, a fence uh, design yet to be determined along the property line, um, as well as another uh, barrier. So that's what's being proposed by the applicant. And any recommendations or thoughts on on what should be included, um, design of the fence, uh, type of trees provided would be would be welcomed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, that's everything for you, is it, Councillor? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And Deputy Mayor Tim. Uh, thank you, Chair. I had two thoughts on this. One, Dean addressed when he uh, clarified the uh, traffic study period of time. I, I, when I first saw when that happened, I was a bit alarmed that, uh, as he stated, during the pandemic wouldn't be the best time to do a, a traffic report. Well, it might work into the favor of those trying to say there wasn't a traffic issue, but uh, overall, it wouldn't be a good time to do it. And secondly, I want to support Kathy's comments about the uh, the trees uh, as well as the fencing there to provide a little privacy and, uh, and of course, sound buffering as well. So, uh, Dean, I don't know how much direction you need from us, but I think that, uh, you know, planting little six inch seedlings wouldn't do the trick. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to encourage that a little bit more than that for the, uh, for the folks on Bicker. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Russell, would you uh, like to comment on this or ask any questions? Sure, if I could, thank you. Um, the traffic study I think is interesting and uh, 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 Councillor Ruffett, I think uh, it's time we had a conversation about traffic studies, I've got an idea, but not for this meeting. Um, curious about the school attendance, uh, that was raised Over as against. a... <laughs> That's, that's subject to the discussion later on. Uh, curious about school attendance, wondering how close is, uh, the adjacent schools, uh, Sackville Heights uh, Elementary, Junior High, and Norwood High, are to being at what they designate a peak capacity. 
Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so we do have, so we, we did circulate the application to the HRCE. Uh, we haven't received um, comments back, but we do have access to their long range outlook uh, pamphlet booklet, uh, which does give uh, an idea of in 2019, what the capacities were of each school and what they project into the future. So I do have those stats here with me. Um, so it's for the next 10 years, Millwood High and Sackville Heights Elementary are projected to be over capacity. Uh, I don't have the specific numbers, but they would be over capacity. That's what the projections are. And Sackville Heights Junior High is projected to be at capacity. So okay. um, yeah, no, nothing is projected to be under at this point in time, 2019 data. Great, okay, thank you. Um, I suspect that we will see a continuing trend along, along these lines. And, and I don't think it should be uh, I don't think it should act as a, a, a driver or a decision maker as far as the development agreement goes. I do think it would give us the ability to uh, talk to the province and, and see what we can do about uh, uh, endorsing more schools in areas that are growing like heck everywhere. Um, what we had seen some 20 years ago up until now is school populations decreasing. But gosh, the population statistics around HRM, where we have seen them on a constant rise. And, and if you had a look at the uh, projections coming into budget, I think it was last week. I don't think, no, maybe it was just, th this might sound odd. I think it was yesterday. Um, the, the population stats, uh, they're growing quite a bit across HRM. And so if we can advocate for uh, additional school spaces, not just portables. Uh, Harry Hamilton has had portables almost since it was built. Um, Millwood Elementary, uh, same thing. Um, then this type of thing would give us that ability. So those are my those are my comments and concerns. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, how about you? Do you have anything you would like to ask or comment on? Uh, thank you very much and uh, agree with uh, Councillor Russell wholeheartedly on the uh, the school situation. I think it's uh, the time is now to have those conversations before we get into a, a, a major crunch with schools, although I suspect for a development like this, um, it's, uh, it, it's going to be more of the, the senior population that will be uh, interested in this uh, this style of uh, housing uh, as opposed to uh, larger families. But uh, you're right, the school uh, conversation needs to be had. Uh, the only other thing that I've been hearing from uh, residents on Baker Drive was uh, about uh, fire ants. And uh, I think, uh, Dean, if I'm not mistaken, you uh, you brilliantly answered one resident who sent uh, an email to you uh, last week, I think, about that. And maybe you could just quickly address that for the uh, for the committee. Sure. Yes. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so it was a, I'm going to be honest, that was a, it's a unique um, question, something that doesn't come up in every <laughs> engagement. Uh, but but um, we do have at the time of permitting uh, the requirement to uh, for the applicant to enter into a construction management plan. And that construction management plan requires consultation with the uh, budding residents um, to, to work out, to try and mitigate as much as possible uh, any nuisance that could come from the construction. So that would be an opportunity um, for the local residents on Baker Drive and, and elsewhere um, to consult with the uh, property owner about how, how to deal with those fire ants at, at that point in time in terms of extermination. Um, I, and this is something purely speculation, but a lot of earth is going to be removed from this site um, for, for the uh, for the development too. So I think that in itself might be a solution as well, but I'm, I'm not an expert on, on fire ants. So. Yeah, chances are the ants are going with them. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, and um, I, am, have no, I have no real concerns about it. It seems like a logical place if we're going to build apartments that, um, next to a fire hall and on a main highway and a bus route and everything else that goes along with it. Um, I do have concerns about traffic because it's getting pandemic or no pandemic, the traffic on Sackville Drive 
is getting heavier and heavier. Um, I happen to live up past that area and getting to Lower Sackville, especially on a Saturday or any day of the week right now, you, you tend to get uh, hung up from about Connolly Road down. You're stopped for the light at Beaverbank Road. And it can take quite a while to get down there. Um, there is the option that I can go around on the highway and come back in to Lower Sackville that way, but it, uh, it doesn't work for everybody and it won't work for people in that particular area. Um, I don't know. <laughs> they won't have any choice but to go down Sackville Drive. Um, Millwood would take them over to the Beaverbank Road and then they'd have to drive back down the Beaverbank Road. So really, there's no other option. So I think we have to be a little concerned about the traffic because I'm sure that um, the traffic studies aren't always 100%. I've been on this committee for a few years and I know that they never ever have said that it would be a problem including on the Bedford Highway. <laughs> it's, um, you know, that's that's my biggest concern there. I, otherwise, I think, you know, it's a fine location, but we have to hope that everybody takes the bus, I guess. I can't think of any other solution to the traffic problem. Okay. So we had a list of, things that people were interested in seeing um, as our recommendations, which were landscaping, lighting, making sure there is a buffer between uh, these buildings and Baker Drive, schools being probably at the top of the list, and, along, and, and traffic being these uh, would be the second, I would think. Um, the landscaping, the lighting, and the buffer are basically concerns of the people who live on Baker Drive, but the others, I think, are going to be concerns for everybody in Lower, Middle, and whatever Sackville. So, if somebody would like to make a motion remembering that we are can make motions to refuse the request with, we have to have a good reason for that. Uh, we can make a motion that we accept it with no condition, or we can make a motion to accept it with our recommendations attached. So if somebody would like to do that, and I'll ask you to please State your name when you make a motion. And please don't leave it all up to Councillor Gammon and, and, and Councillor Otet. They seem to I be don't mind. motion makers. Uh, yes, Jacqueline. I don't mind putting my name to a motion uh, that we suggest the development agreement, but with conditions. Okay. And those conditions being what was discussed. Um, you know, fencing. Uh, traffic study to make sure that we we put in place what needs to be done to make the traffic and the road and the how people will move around safe um, that we that there is more communication with HRCE about schools and overcrowding um, and and that we take into consideration the you know in addition to a fence, I think we said fence, schools, uh, traffic control uh, issues being looked at and addressed and Landscape. all the landscaping that needs to be done to protect the Baker Street residences. Okay. Okay, can I ask, um, uh, yeah. Alicia, is it? Yeah, it's Alicia. <laughs> yes, Madam Chair, Alicia prepares the minutes. So she 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 probably has a motion. Yes, prepared. Yeah. 
Hi, Madam Chair. I do have something just drafted up here. Would you like me to read it out or do you want me to put it in the comments? All right, no, please put it out, uh, read it out and um, let everyone hear it. Okay, and I'll put it in the comments as well. Yes, okay. Okay, um, that the Northwest Planning Advisory Committee has reviewed the application for case 23058 and recommends approval of the application with consideration given to mitigating light pollution on Baker Drive, reducing impacts on schools, traffic mitigation, and providing an adequate buffer to reduce noise and provide privacy for residents on Baker Drive. Okay. Uh, the schools that were you all happy with um, mitigating the impact on the schools? Or is there another way you want to word that? Probably expressing concern. I don't know if we can ask them to mitigate it. No. We could express our concern about the impact on school capacity. Point of order, um, schools are not within our jurisdiction as far as I'm concerned. That's a provincial. No, but it, um, I think that we can express our concern with the fact that the schools in question are at or near capacity. And I mean, we, we aren't going to uh, technically influence anyone, but we can express our concern and pass that along to the councillors who can then express their concern to a higher level of government. Does that work for you, Nick? I just think it's wheel spinning, to be honest. You think it's what? We're, we're, it's a waste of time. I don't, uh, think, I don't think it's going to um, influence this file in any way that, you know, we're talking about something that we have no authority on. Um, so, I mean, if the councillor wants to raise it, then that's great. That's their, that's their initiative. But I, I, as a committee, we're not charged with considering the capacity of the school. Um, technically, I think we are, since we are allowed to comment, uh, we, we, we are not allowed to deny because of that, but we are allowed to comment and, and raise the concern. I think that's our job, to raise concerns. Madam Chair? Yes? Uh, just, I guess, to kind of clarify what I think Nick is saying, is, is uh, the school capacity something that can be included as a condition on our recommendation to approve if we don't have jurisdiction over those schools? Okay. Is there a way to maybe a lot, uh, you know, a sidebar to this that, you know, planning? Uh, it, it, uh, we, we cannot include it as a condition, but we can include the uh, schools as a, a recommendation that they be considered. And yeah, I, I think, Madam Chair, what I envisioned was it being expressed as a concern, but keep in mind the Dean's also waiting to hear back from the school board uh, because part of this process is to update the school board on our growth plans and to see what they have concerns and whatnot. So for us to say that we have a concern about uh, school capacity or we're concerned that the HRSB hasn't responded yet to Dean's uh, inquiry, I, I think that's fair ball. Well, yeah. Yeah, I think you know we're not we're not making anything dependent on on the school situation yeah. because that's not possible. We are recommending that the school situation be taken be, be looked at mm -hmm. because um, that's the only way anything will ever happen with the school situation. Okay. Uh, Whatever. Um, who? Okay, I didn't write down who who made the. Uh, Madam Chair, Jacqueline um, yeah. um, moved yeah, it, and we made the motion. And, and we I, require a seconder. Yes, we didn't have a seconder yet, and I I just wanted to clarify that because the way it was written, it um, it wasn't clear to me what we were asking about the schools. 
I'm happy to second unless one of the members want to, Madam Chair. As, as it stood. Um, mm -hmm. yep. okay. All right, it's moved by Jacqueline and seconded by Tim that we approve the um, approve the proposal with the recommendations that we have attached to the motion. Okay. Question. All in favor, all in favor aye. 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 Entree minded nay. Motion is carried. Okay. And we did have the applicant and uh, Trevor Adams and Shelley Dickey from Dick Shelley Dickey Land Use Planning with us by phone. And we thank them very much for being there. And if you uh, would like to now leave the meeting, we thank you. Okay. Our next task tonight is to go to 7.1.2, case number 21639, Margison Drive Master Plan, Margison Drive and the Highway 101 Interchange in Middle Sackville. And that will be presented by Shane Vipon and Stephanie Saloon. If you are ready, Shane, Stephanie. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair. I'm just gonna share, uh, share my screen. Madam Can Chair, Stephanie had a, big, had a big night last night at Regional Council. She presented the uh, Home for Chollard, uh, Children uh, file and got it okay. approved. So congratulations to you, uh, Stephanie. Thank you. Can okay. everyone see yeah. the presentation now? Yes. Okay. At least I can. Okay, good evening, Madam Chair and members of Northwest Planning Advisory Committee. Uh, my name is Stephanie Saloum and I'm a planner with the Rural Policy and Applications team. Um, I also, today we also have uh, my colleague, Shane Vipon, who's also a planner with the Rural Policy and Applications team. And today we're presenting um, a Planning 101 presentation um, with consideration of the Master Planning Project, Case 21639, for Middle Sackville. So today uh, we, we had a presentation at your last meeting to talk a bit about the master planning project. And we thought today we might take a few steps back um, to talk about how planning can happen in HRM the policy framework and regulation framework, uh, what the role of the province and the municipality is, and what is master planning and sort of how that is being considered for Middle Sackville. So I will say that this presentation is set up as a resource document for you. So it is a bit text heavy. We won't touch on every single point that's shown up on, this, on the slides, but we wanted you to have this presentation as a resource um, as we continue through this process. So HRM, development is allowed in HRM through various levels of planning legislation or various levels of legislation. At the provincial or top level, we have the HRM charter, which is not just about planning, but it does set out the planning framework. What are we allowed to do as a municipality um, in terms of what documents can the municipality um, adopt, municipal planning strategies and land use bylaws, and what the contents of those documents can be, what planning tools we can use, what the authority of council is, and, and um, 
what the baseline engagement program must entail. So under the charter, oops, under the charter, um, there are various planning tools that we're allowed to use. So we can, we can um, enable development through a subdivision process, zoning, development agreements, or site plan approval. The role of the province is to ensure that any planning documents created by the municipality are reasonably consistent with a list of uh, statements of provincial interest. And these statements are relative to farmland, floodplains, drinking water supply, affordable housing, infrastructure, and construction of the Nova Center. The role of the planner is to be the middle person through a planning process, where the main plan, where the main contact for the planner, sorry, the public, landowners or developers, committees and council. We draft policies and regu regulations. We develop recommendations for council, negotiate with developers, and we help navigate the planning process. We then present recommendations to council and to the committees for then approval and recommendations of development projects. What is a municipal planning strategy? A municipal planning strategy is a policy document that tries to balance various interests and priorities in the municipality. So we have social, social political, economic, and environmental, for example, interests. It's not just limited to land use planning. It can describe future actions to be taken, but they're not binding. And it can apply to the entire municipality, the entire region, or to specific areas. Municipal planning strategies are developed to guide where development and growth investment of services should occur. It outlines specifically what planning tools we can use for different types of development and if certain uses are permitted in some areas and others not. It also outlines a list of criteria that we can consider when looking at certain development proposals and that's something you might be familiar with when you're looking at the development agreement process like what Dean just presented where there's sort of a list of criteria in the policy to consider when we look at approving or recommending approval for development. A land use bylaw is a regulatory document. It's, it's based on the municipal planning strategy. It aligns with the municipal planning strategy. It can, cannot prohibit all developments. It regulates uh, things like lot sizes, building heights, building forms, design, and uh, different sort of regulations for where to situate a building. In the municipality, we have a hierarchy of planning documents. At the regional level or top level, we have the regional municipal planning strategy and regional subdivision bylaw. That municipal planning strategy applies to the entire of HRM. Then the municipality is divided into various communities. And for each community, we have a secondary municipal planning strategy and a community level land use bylaw. We also have functional and priorities plans. You may have heard of the Green Network Plan, the Integrated Mobility Plan. These plans are strategic plans. They're not policy documents, but they inform future changes to policy documents. The regional plan, the regional municipal planning strategy has a guiding principle for the entire municipality. It's more of a high level document that looks at fostering growth of healthy and vibrant communities, strong economy and sustainable environment. This map shows um, the various secondary plans and different community plans that we have. 
We have a total of 22 and the Middle Sackville Master Plan area covers or touches on two community level plans or community plan areas. And we'll get into that a bit later. Each community has at least one land use bylaw. So there's 22 municipal or secondary planning strategies and 23 land use bylaws with a total of 488 zones. They're quite a lot of documents that we, we look at for regulating development in the municipality. What is as of right development? As of right development is development that can occur without going to council first for approval. So typically it's uses or development that can be permitted under the regulatory land use bylaw. The development officer can approve this type of development. Sometimes a site plan approval or variance approval is required prior to getting a development permit. And if development is permitted in the land use bylaw, it cannot be prevented if it complies with the land use bylaw. An enabled, an enabled discretionary planning application is a type of application you would more common, uh, more frequently review, um, which is a planning application or a development project where there is policy that exists to consider that development. This a planning application through a discretionary or enabled planning process um, is usually defined in the HRM charter. There's policy to there's policy that exists to consider the request, and many a times there's a, a list of criteria for us to consider when looking at those projects, and we try to see if the proposal is reasonably consistent with that policy. Some examples of these types of applications are land use bylaw amendments or development agreement proposals. A plan amendment is a change to a policy document or a municipal planning strategy. In this case, there's no policy to consider or no enabling policy to consider a proposed development. These types of applications are only supported where they're only supported in extremely um, exceptional circumstances where there's existing policy under the regional plan that it doesn't necessarily align with the secondary or community plan, or there's circumstances have changed that warrant consideration of a request. So what is master planning? Master planning is a comprehensive discretionary planning process. So a discretionary planning process requires approval of council before getting permits and it also requires a public engagement program. It involves community visioning and trying to figure out if there's changes to the policies are required to enable a community vis vision. It's only allowed for areas that are identified under the regional plan for future growth. And there's a, a process, it follows the secondary plan amendment process. So it would be looking at if there's support under the regional plan to do a plan amendment process and then amending the secondary or community plan to enable a community vision um, and enable certain desires of the community. These are just some examples of matters that are typically considered through a master planning project. I won't go through all of them. Um, you'll have them in as for a resource. And just to touch on the role of Northwest PAC, so this is taken from your terms of reference, you're very familiar with this, um, but in terms of master planning, um, Northwest Planning Advisory Com Committee can um, advise the community council with regards to amending planning documents, so about um, community plan amendments, as well as uh, with respect to planning matters. So Middle Sackville is identified under the regional plan as an urban local growth center. 
So just to provide some context about urban local growth centers and master planning for Middle Sackville versus other growth centers. At the last meeting, there was mention of some other communities where there has been master planning. And we just wanna uh, highlight that this area is very different to some of those other areas that have already had master planning. So the regional plan outlines different categories of growth centers. There's urban district growth centers, which is where you'd find um, places like Sandy Lake, um, Bedford South, Bedford West. Um, there's some others as well. The urban local growth center for Middle Sackville, the characteristics envisioned are a bit different. And it's, it's important to note here that um, the difference between an urban district growth center is that it's fully serviced, whereas the Middle Sackville urban local growth center is not fully serviced. It would be serviced only by water, central water. So I won't go through this table, but it's just showing you that um, at the regional plan level, there's a list of characteristics envisioned for an urban local growth center. So these characteristics are considered through the master planning process. It's providing some direction for the master planning process, but it's not, uh, it's not binding. It's just to provide some direction on some high level direction on what we can look at through the process. This is the specific policy under the regional plan that allows us to look at master planning for Middle Sackville. And when we do master planning, we also consider other municipal priorities. Um, we can look at the functional plans or priorities plans, um, but we have heard, for example, um, for Middle Sackville so far, there's been interest from transit for a new park and ride terminal. And there's also been potential interest from fire services to um, put in a new fire station in the master planning area. So the two secondary plans or community plans um, and land use bylaw areas that we would be looking to amend for this master planning exercise. So the Middle Sackville Master Plan area touches the Beaver Bank, Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville Plan area, as well as the Sackville Plan area. The secondary plans, these secondary planning policies or plans, they don't um, enable the characteristics of an urban local growth center. So the master planning process would be to amend these documents to align with the direction of the regional plan, as well as the community vision. So I believe Shane touched on this a little bit at the last presentation, um, but this will be provided again as a resource for you. So there was community visioning done for Middle Sackville in 2011. Um, there's several desires that have been listed here that came from the community. So this is something we would consider as we're trying to develop new policies through the master planning exercise. So the goal of the Middle Sackville Master Project is really to create new secondary planning policies and land use bylaws, <clears throat> bylaw regulation, sorry, for the Middle Sackville Master Plan area in line with the rural plan direction for an urban local growth center and with consideration of the Middle Sackville community vision. Shane had gone through a bit of this at the last presentation, um, but just to recap, there have been, um, there, there are already preliminary land uses envisioned for the properties within the Middle Sackville um, master plan area. So we will, uh, there, and, and these have been divi divided into different priorities. So it's gonna be looked at through a staged approach. Um, the first stage is involving uh, lifting growth control for um, developments or subdivisions that have already been approved in concept. So this is something we, we hope to provide more information on at the next meeting. Um, there's also the other two priorities is where we want to have more discussions about design and site layout and uh, more about uh, new policies that we can develop under the community level plans. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie.
And now, questions and comments from the committee. And we'll begin this time with Stacy Rutterham. Before, sorry, Madam Chair, just yes. before we do that, is it possible for me um, just to check in with Shane if he has anything to add for the okay. presentation? <laughs> if he hasn't fallen asleep yet. <laughs> well, it's too late, sorry. Yeah, we're, we're struggling. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, if you could put that uh, that back up, Stephanie, I wouldn't mind uh, having a crack at that that last slide to maybe round out the discussion. I thought the presentation was very well done, so thank you. Um, thank you. So we'll just wait for Stephanie to. Well, while we're waiting, so last last day when we had a, a conversation, if you will, about this this process, um, it was a lot of information. I think at the end of it, there was some anxiety about whether or not this committee was in the position to be able to go forward and deal with this kind of thing. And, um, and out of that, there was a discussion about, um, about the inference of scope of this process. And what I wanna do right now is kind of uh, explain to you and differentiate this particular process from some of the other uh, growth centers that Stephanie referred to in that in that earlier slide. You saw all the circles. Stephanie, could you go back to that slide um, with the growth centers, please, for regional planning? So she, when she talked about places like uh, Port Wallace and Bedford South and Bedford West, all represented by uh, by these uh, little dots here, most of them in yellow, um, urban district growth centers. And these were urban applications of master plans. And typically when you have an urban application, in, in this particular case, the way that uh, these were managed were there was policy that was put in place in advance, um, dealing with capital cost contributions for, to deal with financial issues, um, there was uh, a method of establishing where infrastructure would go, where uh, how streets would align based on a number of issues, where uh, where the services would go on, um, on those road allowances, where open space would be designated, what parcels would be um, would be allocated for higher density, lower density development, uh, uh, other forms of development, commercial, institutional, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that that is one model, and um, there that is still being pursued in uh, different uh, at different uh, paces, if you will, throughout the municipality in different locations. So we've only got four, three or four targeted designated areas within the service boundary where these processes are either largely complete or commencing at some point and uh, moving forward. There are some constraints with some of those developments. I won't get into that, but I wanna really bring it over to the middle Sackville example and what is different with this particular exercise. Um, so the only, the infrastructure is already in, so the roads are already there. Can we go back to, can we now go Stephanie to that parcel layout? Um, where we've got the parcels designated with the description. Thank you. So um, March and Drive and the Highway 101 interchange is already in place. Those, those streets do not have to be created. Uh, there may be the potential of one additional small cul-de-sac and, and that is probably unlikely. So we won't have to worry about new streets. We won't have to worry about um, subdivisions of any kind in this particular uh, master plan. So in effect, it is almost a mini master plan. It's a very simplified version of what, uh, what would happen inside the service boundary with the common element being the extension of a pot potable water main, some architectural features that, and uses that tie one side of the highway to the other and um, and some potential cost sharing, um, uh, what we might call a local improvement charge 
that's the way it's initiated in the, the council. For those of you that are to council, with, uh, for those of you that are familiar with, with uh, what an LIC is, but it's really just to allocate uh, the proportional charges of the extension of the, the main. Anyway, it's not really something we need to get bogged down in, but this is not, um, this is not a capital cost contribution uh, with, a, with a, a requirement to go to the URB and all of that. It's very much more simplified. Uh, now, at the end of the day, that model might change as we go through, but it's really intended to be about the development of each one of these parcels based on the community vision, based on um, the developer's input, because at the end of the day, it isn't just about what the municipality wants, it's about the, the people that own it and what they, how they can manage it or else it just doesn't get developed, right? So it's, it's really that relationship that we're looking to build um, and, uh, and locate. So I, what I wanted to do essentially was to simplify this in your mind. So we're really just looking at developing each one of these parcels on a, on a parcel by parcel basis and making sure that we adhere to the, the, the vision in concept and spirit and that we create some commonalities. But since there isn't any policy in place in advance to uh, provide for this other than the regional plan policy, there's no specific local plan policies that directs, direct this development unlike Port Wallace, unlike a Sandy Lake, um, we're, we're really going forward and creating this entity ourselves. And it would, if we do it right, it'll ultimately be the 24th land use bylaw. If it's a master plan that stands alone or if it's embedded in the local community planning documents, um, it'll be the 24th. You'll remember Stephanie said, uh, there were 23 land use bylaws and 22 municipal planning strategies. So we would have the 23rd and 24th, the policy and the implementing land use bylaw that governs these lands. So um, I think what Stephanie suggested is that next day, we're going to get into all of the priorities and uh, talk about the rationale. So we'll come with much more information about what those are. But I really want to kind of bring the complexity, complexity of this down um, and to give you some, some faith and some sense that this is very doable at your level and, uh, and we're prepared uh, obviously to be supports in all of this. So uh, rest assured it, it will be an interesting project as we go forward. The other thing that I do wanna mention is um, we are, uh, we've got a PIM date that we're considering um, after next day. So the, the presentation going into next week would also talk about uh, some public information prep because we're planning to, on putting that together uh, for the committee. So with that, I'll leave it there. And um, you know, most of the questions I understand uh, will probably go to Stephanie's uh, presentation, but by all means, if you have anything uh, that I can help with, then uh, feel free. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Okay. So, yeah, Stacy, we'll go back to you now and ask if you have any uh, questions for either uh, Stephanie or Shane about what we've just seen. Okay. Well, um, I appreciate the uh, overview of all the different layers of jurisdiction and and how decisions get made and who has authority and and what those decisions are based off of. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, uh, not just tonight, but in other, other uh, descriptions about um, this development area is um, the, there's this uh, proposal to change the timelines on, on developing um, the last bits of residential property. And I, I feel like your maps are out of date because there's a lot of development that's not showing up on those maps that has already taken place. And I, I think for us as a community uh, group to be able to really have honest conversations, I think those maps need to be updated as we go through this process. I've been through there quite a bit and there are streets missing that are completely built. 
Um, which leads me to my next question about this proposal to change uh, the timelines on on that particular part of this this uh, um, planning process. Um, the other thing I'm I'm not lo really looking for an answer about tonight, but I guess one of the things that I'd like to understand a little bit better is how this plan and how this process is going to impact future um, numbers of zoning amendments and, and changes. Like we've seen this happen all over the HRM. It's been happening in my uh, district uh, where a plan is made, a vision is, is made, and then somebody comes in and, and starts applying for zoning amendments immediately before any attempt or any, any other development occurs. And so I'm just kind of curious about the value of this process and what it is going to mean for the community going forward long-term with respect to changes consistently and constantly coming up. I think every one of the um, amendments that we've sort of dealt with here uh, with regard to development agreements and, and also um, any zoning amendments have sort of you know, been long-term proposals that are changing or have been canceled or put on hold and then there's, there's this application to kind of, you know, go, go past what has already been approved and, and change it up. And, and, and that kind of impacts all of the community around anything when it's being developed. So I'm not necessarily looking for an answer about that, but I would kind of like to understand what the purpose of this master plan is with regard to protecting these developments as they are, are being approved and as they're going forward. And also I do really want to request that the maps get updated for the developments that have, have already occurred. Okay, thank you very much. And we will just now go to Jacqueline Levera. Oh, there you are. <laughs> People keep moving around on my screen, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, as I go back to the first few slides that we were looking at, I really appreciate Stephanie, uh, you know, going back and, and looking at the process uh, rather than starting with here, what's what's we're going to do with the master plan. But one of my questions was there was that sort of circular design. So how much of the community visioning has already happened? Because there seems to be a lot of work that has already happened because we have all these things that we want to happen or that the community has said they want, is that you know done in a circular way that it continues that community visioning or those public meetings for what will go where and how and when and on what timeline? Uh, Shane, maybe you could answer. <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably more appropriate for me and for Ann. Uh, oh, because uh, uh, you know better. Uh, yeah, so the community vision vision was completed, actually commenced in 2009 and was completed in 2011. It was always contemplated that uh, the implementation phase of the vision, that is this, the master plan or some form of secondary planning document would follow. And because um, so, a lot of work went into the community vision is and can attest being the chair of the committee. Uh, and it was, it was a long two, two plus years. But um, then uh, priorities and resources changed uh, internally and the implementation got put on hold. And that was unfortunate, but the regional plan was uh, being worked on. And uh, so uh, staff and senior management decided to put the implementation uh, away uh, in advance. So uh, the, the, the vision is done, it's completed uh, and has been done for a long time and, and we're actually behind in implementing it. So um, it, the vision took into account lands right up until the county line. We're only really uh, looking at the master plan as a viable option because it is within a growth center identified by the regional plan. So it is the priority out of um, 
out of the rest of the lands that were encompassed in the vision. And it makes the most practical sense from, uh, from that standpoint. Uh, so in answer to your question, um, yes, the, the vision is complete. It's, uh, it's not circular in the, in the sense that it can be modified, but I should note that it is conceptual. It's, it's much akin to um, some of the policy that's generalized in the sense that it's not, an a, there are no absolutes in a vision, it's a concept and, uh, and an understanding. And when you get into the implementation of this, um, then, then you as a committee, we as staff and the developer are going to have to come to some agreement on what, how that, that vision is represented. And does it accurately represent, uh, or, do, or the implementation of the vision, is it accurately resemp, uh, representing the vision? So uh, that's the idea. And of course, when you bring it forward into real time, um, you know, we've got demands for housing and, and the question around density, how many houses should go into a given location. All of that are, are things that we'll have to discuss going forward. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. I just wanted to touch on the last speaker's um, point as well. I think um, one of the things that we're seeking to do is uh, entrench uh, these land use decisions in policy so that they're not easily amended. So I think it's, it's fair to say that the approach that, that Stephanie and I are looking at is to create land use policy that would enable uh, enable someone to go and apply for a development permit once it's approved. And now, in, in order to go back and and change things, um, that it would have to be within the spirit of the policy. So we, that would already have to be vetted with the with the committee, and the committee would have to have already made that decision with with the uh, other stakeholders that that it was an appropriate a use of land so that an amendment could be made. Otherwise, it would be in con con it would be contrary to policy that we're going to create. Now, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but, uh, but the idea is to entrench these things so that they're not easily changed unless it was already contemplated. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is that okay with you, Jacqueline? Great. Okay. Um, Kathy, uh, yeah, Kathy Jones Wilson, Regina Jones Wilson. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm going cross eyed here. <laughs> no, I'm just taking it all in right now. I don't have any questions right now. Okay, thank you. And Nick Horn, your turn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you to the presenters. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Vipon specifically. Um, there, I'm on now. Uh, Shane, uh, recently through council, uh, we had a development in East Hants go through that uh, highlighted some species at risk and the altering of a creek where specifically uh, wood turtles reside. Um, this this file went through council, it went through committees, it went through discussions and many meetings and planning. When you talk about um, amending planning policy to make things smoother, um, should we be including uh, some environmental review so that this doesn't happen again, so that uh, if an application comes to your desk and there's a glaring environmental flaw, you can just push it back and say, no, this doesn't, this doesn't need to be looked at any further. Thanks for the question, Nick, uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, it's a good question. I, I think I'll just step back by describing the conditions in the, the other application you were talking about, the wood turtle application. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, if we had hindsight, we, we might have been able to contact uh, provincial authorities in order to determine if there was some some sort of issue with respect to the wood turtle. I don't see um, that being any different in this case, but I, I think it should be clear that uh, we don't have any jurisdiction 
with respect to uh, species at risk unless uh, we don't, the province does. The province implements all of those restrictions there. They have a permit-based system. Uh, so they effectively would, irrespective of what we approve, they are a higher order of government. So they have their own process. So at the end of the day, if there were a species at risk in habitat and this was designated, they would put their own machinery in place. Um, whereas at the municipal level, we don't have the authority under the HRM charter to regulate that. So uh, just to sort of butt in a little bit, uh, I understand our jurisdiction and, and our place in the whole thing. What I'm, what I'm getting at is, is the fact that uh, council and planning staff and committees, they spend a lot of time on this when really if it had been uh, you know, addressed at the onset, the time wouldn't wouldn't have been wasted, and your time is valuable. I know that. Um, yeah, the four the four month delay to get the supplementary report probably could have been avoided. Uh, so, so I agree with that point. Um, that being said, I think the recommendation ultimately was consistent and has been consistent all along. Uh, now, let's just bring it forward to this process. So, certainly, uh, we'll have regard for all of those issues where we have regard, we will have regard for impacts to the water course. Um, and there is a, a new floodplain contemplated for impacts to the water course. So all of that has been considered uh, in, in preliminary analysis. And we will make sure that everything is consistent with all provincial regulation under our ability to impact it or to, uh, to make it known to other bodies, regulatory that, uh, that lie above us. So um, we'll make sure that, that the policy environment is crystal clear and, um, and then we'll go forward. And if the province has a regulatory duty to come in after and impact this, well then they'll do that under, under their charge and under their own mandate. Okay. okay. That's it for you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Diggle Gammon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the uh, presentation, Stephanie, and uh, the, that added commentary, Shane. It was very helpful. When I was doing my prep for this, I didn't. I didn't get to. I didn't see this presentation. So are we seeing it for the first time now? I'm just curious when I was looking at the agenda and stuff. So is this a presentation that will be sent to us so that you know I can refer back to it when I'm getting a little bit confused every now and again, because uh, there's some excellent information there that I know I'll just, I'll probably re be referring back maybe a few times over the course of this uh, journey that we're taking. But um, yeah, lovely process, really nicely laid out. And maybe a little bit of building on um, uh, Nick, Nick Horn. I think at the very beginning slide when we said, you know, we had the, the four discs there and it was like social, political, environmental, and economic, I think, right? So uh, yeah, I think that one, I think so far in my, my journey, this, I do think sometimes that the environmental is a little bit light when we're looking at stuff. And so a little bit more emphasis on environmental would be helpful. And I think also in relation to Halifax and uh, on that priority, especially to, you know, the green network and Halifax and, and how uh, any kind of master planning is going to follow those priorities and strategies is going to be really helpful. So again, I just, I really like the presentation and I don't have any questions per se. Um, but the depth of when we're reading these things, like how much more deep we can go into some of those issues, I think will be really helpful, especially around really good planning. So thank, thank you. you. And uh, I just want to mention that uh, Andrea is going to send this information to all of us. So she'll, she'll, she'll forward it to you um, electronically. Okay. So we'll all have a copy. At least that's what I think she said down here. Sometimes it's it's hard to read in a hurry. But, um, 
yeah, that's the, um, that, that I think will help you when, when we're going back over things. Yeah, we're going to let Deputy Mayor Tim have a few words here. Thank you. Yeah, few words. That'd be nice. I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so listen, thank you, first of all, Stephanie and, and Shane for the presentation. And I'm glad it's being sent because the first thing on my list here was that could we send those to those, could we send this to those who aren't here this evening? I am becoming a little bit concerned about this because we have some folks and we all have reasons why we can't attend meetings, et cetera. But we're, we're heading into a bit, and I know Shane's trying to minimize this, but we're also heading into a heavy duty project here that I don't think our planners want to start at square one at every meeting. So, you know, if people can't make a meeting, it would be nice if they had a little catch up or a refresh or whatever they kept them, because I view it as if we're going to be moving and moving up here and not having to start over again at every meeting, sort of. So we're going to have to make sure that people stay current on what's going on and, and this sort of thing. And sending them this uh, excellent presentation, I think, is a way to, to start. So thank you for the presentation, and, and I'm glad to hear it's being circulated. Um, I gave a nice little rant last time about uh, how I hope we will learn, uh, and we better learn, the good and the bad from what went right in, in West Bedford and South Bedford and, uh, and upcoming in Sandy Lake. I, that rent was a little bit more uh, geared, I think, towards uh, poor Kathy there, what she'll be going, she and Tony will be going through in, uh, in Port Wallace. But I do think there's some overlap here with, with this. And I, I would say it's, it's, it's very unfortunate. There's a couple of things that jumped out at me. I, I'm not the counselor for this area and you're probably all, staff's probably very relieved that's the case because I would say first of all I would not want to be going into this with a vision that's 11 or 12 years old it started in 2009 it's going to start hitting the streets in 2022 it was passed in 2011 so I hope there will be some check-ins and and this sort of thing and Shane you, you touched on this a little bit and gave me some some comfort that because uh, I've seen this on the Bedford waterfront Don't, you know what happened what everybody thought was cool 10 years earlier suddenly with with housing shortages with development fatigue with traffic with changing uh, demographics and, and immigration and diversity and whatnot don't assume something that 12 years ago is still necessarily involved. And I think I'm hearing that from you. I think it would be very unfortunate if there wasn't some sort of a CCC or something to deal with the things. Yes, I know the roads are in place, but we're already saying we need transit. We need a transit facility. We need a fire station. We're going to need parks and playgrounds. We're going to need uh, things for the kids to do. I would be a little disappointed if I were the counselor for the area, particularly if there wasn't some sort of revenue opportunity to help me. And it's a smaller scale than what Kathy's going to be dealing with it in Port Wallace and Tony, but just keep that in mind. There's, there's got to be some sort of opportunity, you know, that this can't go. Uh, can't just fall on LICs into the general taxpayer, in, in my opinion. Although, you know, this will grow the tax base and growth is, is good. Don't get me wrong. The big difference, you mentioned the roads are in place and that it's going to be, have water but not sewage. Well, that's going to have huge impact, I would think, on density. That's going to have huge impact on lot size. I don't think if you're running septic tanks, you're going to have 35 and 40 foot wide lots the way you might have in, in West Bedford to try and keep house prices down, for example, and in uh, the uh, rural hemlocks area and that sort of thing. So I think there's going to be some, some things that are different there. Uh, I do think some of the things that we have learned from West Bedford as well is, you know, and I mentioned things like noise and garbage and bylaw of noise and, and garbage and the, this sort of thing. Anne touched on this, and I think some others that Stacy touched on this beautifully when she talks about how many changes have gone through and how many amendments. Anne and I have said many times, I think in Bedford South and Bedford West, if we had a dime for every amendment that came forward, you know, we, we, we'd be quite wealthy. So I do want to be careful of that. And the other thing we have to be careful about this is people moving into the area. When the master plan says, and you come into the area, that the, that the high rises are going to be on this side, the low rises on this side, the single family dwelling here, the community center here. And when they buy, they know what they're going to be driving by and they know what they're going to be seeing out of their window, their kitchen window. Well, that changes when we allow DA amendments. And suddenly the tree that's behind them is a 12-story building. And the the and they're driving through high rises to get to their $800,000 uh, R1 neighborhood. 
I'm, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just saying this is the kind of pushback you get. And one of the things that I thought master planning was supposed to try and address, that there was no surprises. You know what's going to be in the neighborhood. You know where it's going to be. And you've got a pretty good idea of when it's going to be as well during the build-up time. So if you're going to make it a little harder, to, and I don't know how you do this, uh, Shane, and, and Stuck, and I don't know how you make it harder because I don't know of a DA that can't be amended. Uh, I don't know how you're going to do that, but if it couldn't be as mend amended quite as easily, I think that would be good news for staff, for the council, for the area, but also for the people, you know, spending the biggest purchase of their life uh, moving into moving into this area. So anyway, just a, a, a little bit of uh, a few thoughts there. Well, I realize this is very different than the other areas that I'm familiar with and what Kathy will be addressing. I do think there are some learnings for here, and I do think we should be looking for some, uh, some revenue opportunities as well, if those sorts of things. And these are big ticket items, uh, transit and fire stations, et cetera. So anyway, my two cents, thanks. Okay, thank you. And, yeah, if, uh, I, Madam Chair, can I, uh, can I respond to the councillor yes, quickly? Can, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we're not proposing to use DAs in this particular uh, study area. Just, uh, just a quick note. Everything uh, we're, pro pro we're proposing to do everything uh, by zone. So there would be no uh, DA amendments because there will be no DAs. And, re and applying to rezone won't be easy? No, because it'll be entrenched in policy. That's what, okay. that's that's what I was trying news. to say. Yeah. yeah, no, that's good news. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I'm just going to say that that's sort of what I was hoping to hear, simply because it can be done. It's a smaller area than most of the others, and it's very local. It's not as spread out. It's, it's not as big as as, as the, the Larry Utec area. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it should be able to be controlled a lot easier. Okay, um, Councillor uh, Russell, did you want to add anything here? Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, based on everything that I've heard, I'm good. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the presentation and the responses and I look forward to seeing the presentation in my inbox. Okay. Thank you. Is uh, Councillor Blackburn still here? I don't see her name up. No, I guess maybe she had to leave. She usually has at least three meetings in a night. Anyway, okay. Uh, Madam Chair, could I just get a quick response from one of the two planners on my concern about the, the plan being 10 or 12 years out of date and just making sure that there's not out of date, but older, just to make sure that check-ins are gonna happen during this period and what's what you look at these check-ins or reconfirmations looking like? Okay. One of you want to answer that? Go ahead. I can, I can try answering that one. Um, so there is a public participation program that we have set out for this project. So yes, there was a community vision that was done uh, several years ago. Um, it is a very conceptual vision. Whereas right now, I think this process gets into more details, but there will be multiple opportunities for the community to get involved. Where because we're in a, a plan amendment um, process, we are mandated to have public information meetings. So the first one that we're hoping to have would be in June. And we're hoping to have, I think, two more after that as we continue through the process and get more detailed about details about the specific priorities or different blocks within the area. Um, and then we're also, I, I had presented a bit on the last meeting, we're going to try and use um, a very interactive, um, more interactive website, Shape Your City site, instead of our Halifax.ca site, so that we can offer more opportunities for the community to get involved and provide inputs and feedback on um, the plans that are going to be looked at for this project. Okay. Well, that sounds good. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I think that's great. But I just, based on my own experience on things, you know, things can shift, priorities and visions can shift over 10 or 12 years and uh, 10 or 12 days sometimes. But the, uh, this sounds good then. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have anything that they would like to add or ask a question? Okay, I'm not hearing from anyone. So 
I'm going to say that we don't have any uh, recommendations to make tonight, except <laughs> keep it simple. <laughs> the, the old kiss principle, please. And um, yeah, I want to thank you both for this. This it's not easy to break these things down and explain it to civilians like us, but um, you're doing a pretty good job, I think. So hopefully we'll be able to actually get into the nitty gritty soon and um, then everybody will understand what actually we're trying to do. It's, it's a little hard to see when it's only on a screen and, and you don't know exactly how it's all gonna work. But it will- Madam work. Chair, if, if I could, Madam Chair, I just wanna give the, the committee a little bit, uh, a little inkling about our thought process going forward. Uh -huh. um, and and what we're, we're talking about behind the scenes in the planning department uh, with this project. We're, we're contemplating at this point, and it's not finalized yet, the potential creation of a subcommittee for the purpose of doing priorities two and priorities three of this. So um, that... And, and what we would seek to do, obviously, is ask any members of uh, the PAC if they want to be involved. That would be the first piece, because we understand that uh, the, the, um, the agendas that are coming up over the next year and a half are going to be very full, very full, and you'll be asked to do a lot. So um, we're contemplating taking this out of the PAC for those two those two priorities, and creating a subcommittee that can that can work and make a recommendation back to PAC. So that's kind of it isn't finalized. Those are thoughts that we're putting out, um, and obviously everyone in the PAC is invited if they wish to to join. Um, this has to go to council, uh, one council a council, and uh, and be approved. And we're in the midst of contemplating going in that direction. That doesn't have uh, any bearing on priority number one. This committee would deal with priority number one. And so we'll be talking more about that next day. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what our thought process is because we don't want to overboard, overburden the members of this committee. Um, we know that you've got some busy and important work to do. So for those that are interested in participating outside of this, then we'll give you the first opportunities to, to sit in and uh, work with the subcommittee. And for, uh, and for those that don't wish to participate, we'll, uh, we'll fill up those seats with, uh, with community members. So that's our thought process that could change because it, it hasn't gone to council yet, but I, th I think it's fair to put that out and, uh, and, and give you a chance to think about that um, because we will be asking um, in the coming weeks, who is interested in participating in that process? Okay, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, you'll see us next uh, next uh, PAC meeting to talk about uh, the priority one, elaborate on this discussion somewhat, and then also uh, talk about the public information meeting prep um, for priority one. So we'll we'll come armed with some information about all of that, uh, but I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave you with that information right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's nothing else then to uh, discuss about the, what we've looked at tonight, I will tell you that our next meeting will be, put my glasses on so I can read, <laughs> June 2nd, will be our regular Northwest PAC meeting. And then we will have a Northwest PAC hosted public information meeting, which I assume will still be virtual for case number 22267, which is <laughs> Tim's favorite. And um, that will be held on May 26th, May 27th, and probably May 31st, because there are a large number of speakers that are expected for this one. And uh, we hope that uh, 
the entire committee will be there. We will need a quorum. And that would be terrible if that didn't happen. So I will probably try to remember <laughs> to send you out a uh, reminder just before the meetings so that you will uh, at least have it in your inbox and hopefully you'll read it. Apparently, some people don't check their emails often enough, but, but we'll have to look into that and, and try and get that straightened away too. Okay. Yeah. So if there's nothing else, I will ask for a motion to adjourn, please. I'll move adjourn, Madam Chair, and thank you to staff very much and to everyone on the committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, there's no vote required.